everybody. Welcome to this beautiful evening, Thursday evening. Uh, we can get it now. Uh, um, right, so we're now opening the planning board meeting. And now we're going to open the planning board. Okay, so we have stewards presenting tonight. Wall um, to the what would be the northeast. 
the... Chuck, excuse me, is that eight feet um, including the arboretum? <coughs> or is it an eight-foot wall? It's an eight-foot wall. So top, you're... Top by the arboretum. So the arboretum don't count in the, in the top of wall calculation. So you're on S3, you have a bottom of... So like in, in this part of S3, just to give you an example, it has... PW 170.4, TW 178.92. Um, in that spot, it would be a 8.5, 8 and a half foot wall. Um, on sheet S4, uh, we do show plantings, again, on both sides of the proposed driveway. Um, we do have um, grass or the ability to put grass on the outside of the curbing. And then the major change was the installation of the row of, of our variety. Um, so that row doesn't count into the elevations we were just talking about. Um, and as you remember, we had previously proposed a four-foot vinyl fence that would shield the headlights, and this was to provide some vertical screening um, to the housing along the route. The next change was on the lighting plan, sheet S5, which was... Sure, how tall are these, these trees that are, or these bushes that are on the corners? How are they tall like blocking the sight lines? With turning in and out and around the corner? I don't think that they would have um, canopy restrictions. They should, you should, theoretically, you should be able to see them under the canopy. So those would be hedge maples. <clears throat> so they're three and a half inches of top. I mean, that's something I could check, but I, I think that you should have a high enough canopy to see underneath them. So that's, that's something I can answer. Um, and then in sheet S5, again, the only uh, substantive change was the light facing down Green Street was removed. Um, and the only light, only yard light that remains is the light interior to the driveway so you can, you can see it. We provided the turning movements. For the gasoline delivery, um, this does um, show that we're requesting a full access driveway on both sides. Um, and the reason being, the truck will come in off green, circulate, drop fuel on the passenger side, and then continue out Fairview. Um, one of the points that came up at the February meeting that's obviously critical, um, DOT through their County permit coordinator um, perceived this project to be only a sidewalk replacement, so did not envision that the department would be involved, um, and has since indicated that they will be involved. Um, today, that they they sent an email um, to myself, copying the chairman, indicating they would like a restricted access on Fairview um, because of the truck turning movement. We're going to work with them on what that restriction will be. Um, because we do have to get the truck in and out, and I don't know if that means trying to maneuver the truck around the site in a different capacity or um, mountable curbing on the Fairview side. So that is one thing that we're going to have to work with the department on. Um, the second thing which we discussed is a stormwater situation, and those two things are outside you know, those are the department's considerations. So outside this board, um, they will kind of give guidance for what the access configuration will be. Another point that has come up, um, and the, the chairman brought it up, and then it was subsequently brought up by another individual, um, this curb island, um, or right now it's just a striped island, but making it a delineated curb island, um, because that's in their roadway network, it would be their control. Um, they so being DOT. They being DOT. So in their original correspondence with us, they had indicated that they were not going to have permit jurisdiction, um, but have since indicated that they'll have jurisdiction of anything between the sidewalks. 
sidewalk and what? Between the sidewalk. Oh, so on like off Fairview between well, the sidewalks yeah. and then so basically just anything that's in the, the intersection or the roadway uh, where previously we did not anticipate them being involved. And Chuck, did they give you any indication of when they would actually let us know, let you know, let us know what their plans are, what any restrictions might be? Um, if we have to submit the traffic study and the fueling, they, they asked for some information. Um, so they requested right in, right out. Um, but with the truck and the mountable curbing, we have to see what ultimately that ends up being. I have a, a question about this then. If, if uh, the DOT uh, requires something that in some way changes, you know, your, your plans, uh, then I would assume that that, that 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 has to come back to us. Yeah, I'm not, I, don't, I think the general hope or sense would be that eventually by, you know, call it next month, um, we'll have some definitive answers from them about the access configuration and the, the stormwater. Um, excuse me, acknowledging that those are overhanging issues for the, the site plan and, and this board's consideration. Um, but again, we didn't envision their participation until two weeks ago. So normally we would have filed, you know, simultaneously the initial site plan here, we would have filed the DOT, and that didn't happen because they had previously indicated they weren't going to participate. Along the same lines, it seems like the chance, which we talked about last time too, um, the notion of boosting pedestrian access and that intersection. Yeah, so, so the, the, the pedestrian access, uh, the curb island, those are, are kind of what we're calling off-site improvements mm -hmm. um, because they're not, you know, they are contiguous to our site, but they're not, um, you know, they're not something we could do whole-handedly. Um, we don't control the, the city's pedestrian, the, the, the signal. Um, I believe the city owns the poles and the signal, but it's DOT's intersection, so there's a little bit of a... Um, Mark will go through the signalization and the, the level of service analysis and things like that. Um, and again, so the pedestrian accommodation is something that we've committed to and remain committed to. Um, the issue is the, the mechanism to get there. So. We previously agreed to do a host community benefit for offsite mitigation, and that pedestrian accommodation will be in that mitigation. But any point is that the DOT is now involved opening up that issue as well? I don't think, from, again, from, and I'll, I'll let Mark, he's more of an expert than I, um, DOT will get involved in the signal. Yeah, they own the signal, then they have to be involved with that, sure. Yeah. So we'll have to deal with the, the, I mean, yeah, DOT will ultimately weigh in on the signalization and, you know, pedestrian phasing if there's a dedicated pedestrian phase or how those, those crosswalks work. Okay. And then the only other thing that we provided were miscellaneous detail sheets that had, um, you know, lights, uh, the wall detail, um, and that's it. And, and some of that information was provided on the, the back of your cover So with, with that, I'll answer any questions you have, or can have Mark go through his, his presentation. How do you guys want to do this? Should we ask Mark to do his presentation and then we'll do that and then we'll ask final questions and then I'll turn it back to the public. Oh, yeah, then I'm going to come up here and the only spot I can really, I've got some visuals here that uh, hopefully they'll you know, address some of your, your questions. Um, my name is Mark Magoni. I'm an associate and a project manager at Great Manning Engineering, and uh, Stewart's had contacted us to uh, conduct the uh, traffic assessment for the, uh, for the project. Um, I apologize, I can't make it any bigger just due to the constraints of the room here. Um, just kind of walk you through some of the, the process of uh, the, the traffic study that we've uh, conducted to date. Um, the first thing we did was identify the project location. We've got the existing stewards on the corner here, Green Street and Fairview Ave. And we looked at the adjacent traffic signal 
uh, just due to the location of the, of the or the existing driveways and the proposed driveways in close proximity to that signal. So the, the first thing that we went out and, and typically do in a traffic study is go out and collect existing information about the intersections and about the adjacent roadways. And what we typically focus on it with the traffic study, I'm not sure how many, uh, how many studies that the city has reviewed, you focus on the worst case morning and afternoon peak commuter times. And that typically occurs between 7 and 9 in the morning and 4 to 6 in the afternoon. And that's when there's the most traffic. So if you can establish that the project will work adequately during those times, you can then make a conclusion that it will work adequately the other 22 hours of the day. So we typically focus on those morning and afternoon commu uh, commuter peaks. It's also the peaks of the, uh, of the stewards just because of the nature of getting gas to and from work uh, and, and, and the convenience uh, portion of, of that site. Uh, we did look at the one signalized intersection, and uh, there's three driveways associated with the site. Uh, well, there's one on Green Street, and there's sort of two on, on Fairview Ave. Uh, we're recommending consolidating the two on Fairview Ave. It's, it's good access management, so you, you minimize the number of conflict points that people uh, have entering and exiting the development. We're also going to relocate the driveway on Green Street as far away from the signalized intersection as we can, again, in order to uh, improve uh, the access on Green Street. We did uh, review and observe pedestrians when we were out in the field in, in addition to uh, transit. Uh, there, Columbia County does have a, a shopping stop, a shopping shuttle stop uh, just adjacent to the site. They'll have to, uh, students will have to kind of work with uh, uh, Columbia County Public Transit to relocate that stop because it's essentially where the new driveway is going to go. Um, and then in, in terms of volume development, what we do is we go out and actually count every, inter every vehicle entering and exiting that intersection, the signalized intersection and also the driveways during those peak commuter times. And then we focus in on the worst case hour. So we, we count from 7 to 9 in the morning. If the worst case hour occurs from 7.30 to 8.30, those are, the, those are the time periods that we look at in terms of, of traffic volumes for the morning and then for the PM say it occurs between 4.30 and 5.30, we, work, we focus on those worst case time periods. Um, from there, we also then look at just general background growth in the area. How has traffic behaved in the area over the, over the last few several years? Because we know that in general, traffic will continue to increase. Uh, and based on a, a review of DOT uh, volumes that are available on their website, it's, uh, you know, traffic volumes have increased approximately half percent per year over the last several years. So we then increased our traffic volumes by half percent to our build year. And then we also contacted the city uh, planning department to see if there's any other developments in the area uh, that would impact traffic. And there was one uh, uh, apartment development uh, located a couple miles north on Fairview Ave um, that we included traffic associated with that development as well. So we took into account all known traffic. So what we essentially do is we determine our design year, figure out what tra how traffic is going to operate in that design year without stewards, and how traffic will operate in that design year with the, the expansion of stewards. And the way we do that is we, um, we, do, we conduct, a, conduct something called a trip generation assessment, meaning we want to know how much traffic the expansion is going to generate uh, during those peak times. And the, the way we do that is, since we counted the existing driveways, we know how much traffic the existing uh, building is generating during those peak times. We know that, for instance, the existing stewards is generating 94 trips during the a.m. peak hour and 88 trips during the p.m. peak hour. We know that because we counted the driveways. We know how much traffic is entering and exiting that development. And based on uh, that, those rates of uh, the square footage, we can then apply that rate to the new square footage of the, of the expansion to say, well, if it's generating 94 trips now and 88 trips now, well, we, we can anticipate it will generate an additional 64 trips in the morning and additional 60 trips in the afternoon. However, you also have to be aware that a stewards in a convenience market like this doesn't generate new traffic the way that a, an office would generate new traffic because it typically pulls traffic from the existing network. It's called pass-by traffic. So most of the people here on the way to work, they make a stop for their coffee or to get gas. So they were already going to pass the site anyways. They're not a new trip on the network. They may be a new trip as a turn into the site, but it's not a new trip into the network. So based on traffic standards, we know that in general, Convenience markets with gas have approximately a 60 to 65 percent pass-by rate. So, even though there may be 64 new new trips and 60 uh, new trips in, uh, entering and exiting the development in the morning and the afternoon, some most of those trips are already are on the network. It's just maybe maybe the the store is a little more attractive. It's got a better you know ice cream Sunday spot, spot so that on someone on the way home from work may grab uh, ice cream for their family on the way home where they may not have done that before. So. When it's all said and done, we're anticipating that 
there are the site-wide actually generated approximately 26 new AM PM peak hour trips and approximately 20 PM peak hour trips. Those are new trips that say right now someone may not go to the steward because it's a smaller steward. Well, it's a bigger steward, so now it's a little bit nicer. They'll, they'll rather go to this steward than, than a different convenience park. So you may pull traffic from other parts of the, of the city. So then we then distribute that traffic onto the, the roadway network based on the observations we already made. So since we know how much traffic is entering and exiting the, the existing stewards, we know what, generally what directions that traffic is coming in. We distribute that onto the network, add it to our design year, and we've got a sort of before and after uh, scenario for, uh, for traffic volumes. And then what we do from there is we have models that we can actually model these intersections and it tells us how much delay, how much delay a, a user will experience as they, tra as they travel through that intersection and, and trying to get out of the development. Um, and it's based just, just like you would get a, a grade in school, you get an A through an F. A is obviously a very good uh, delay, you know, 10 or fewer seconds, and an F is you're waiting there over 80 seconds at a signal or over 50 seconds at an unsignalized intersection. So you're getting a, almost like a letter grade, as you will, that the intersections are in terms of delay. So in terms of uh, the intersection, the signalized intersection, uh, due to the, 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 the layout of the driveways, we're only anticipating maybe 25% of the traffic is actually going to get to the signalized intersection because you've got a lot of the traffic, about, uh, currently about 35% or 30% of the traffic is coming down Green Street, entering into the development, and then coming right back up Green Street. So they're not actually even getting to the signalized intersection. Same thing on Fairview. You've got about 45% of the existing traffic entering in, off of Fairview and then exiting out of Fairview. So, but that traffic, traffic is not even getting into the signal. It's only about 25% of it is getting to the signal. Currently, based on um, the amount of traffic that, that the intersection um, currently experiences, it, it operates at a level sort of C overall. Some of the movements operate at D or uh, around a D or better. But overall, it operates at a level sort of C, and it will continue to operate at similar operating conditions after the increase of those 20 to 26 trips, of which only 25% make to this intersection. So we're not increasing traffic at this intersection a great deal. Um, in terms of the worst, some of the worst case moves are, you know, this Green Street southbound left turn. Again, this is operating at level service C. This Fairview Ave, sort of through left, again operating at level service C. So it's not a failing intersection. It's not operating very efficiently, just due to the antiquated nat nature of the signal. But it's not failing. So. In terms of the amount of traffic we're, we're going to add here, it's not going to all of a sudden have this, this intersection fail because we're not going to be increasing traffic a great deal at, at this location. We also looked at the driveways. So again, like I said, about 30% of the traffic is not even getting into the signalized intersection. About approximately 10% of it will kind of come filter through the intersection and make the right or left turn out. And again, this driveway, based on our, our, our estimates, you're going to wait about 15 to 20 seconds to exit. It's a level <coughs> service B. Um, it's going to be unsignalized. We're going to relocate it. Right now, it's a little closer to the intersection. We're going to move it a little bit farther to the west. Um, the other intersection, again, a lot of that traffic, 45% of it is just coming to and from the north here on Fairview Ave. It's not even, not even going to get to the signalized intersection. Again, uh, this operates at, at a little, uh, little longer delay, level service C, more in the 20 to 25 second range in order to get out on average, of course. If there's queuing that occurs at this traffic signal, people trying to make the left turn out of here have to wait a little bit longer, and maybe they have to wait 40 seconds. But you know, if you know, someone right behind them may only have to wait 10 seconds because they they hit a gap. So on average, they're at they're waiting you know 20 approximately 20 seconds to get out. Um, some of the other things we looked at was the available sight distance from the driveways. The driveway on Green Street, looking to the right, there is some on-street parking that you have to contend with. But just like any other driveway in the city. You have to sort of pull out a little bit to see around that on-street parking. I mean, the city could potentially restrict a little bit of parking there to, to increase sight lines, but uh, it's really not that bad of an issue because uh, the speeds on Green Street are only approximately 30 miles an hour. On Fairview Ave, right now there's this existing shrubs and tree associated with the adjacent uh, residential building that will be removed as part of this project. So right now it's currently limiting uh, sight distance looking to the left on Fairview uh, from that driveway but that'll be removed with the, the proposed project. And I know Chuck had talked about adding some landscaping adjacent to the driveways, but we want to make sure that that's low enough to where someone pulls out, does not, it does not impede their view in their sight triangles. We also looked at queuing on um, the driveway, on Fairview Ave, that queues back past uh, the driveway. And we also looked at queuing on, on Green Street, 
that currently queues past the driveway. Right? On average, you got three to six vehicles with, uh, on uh, Fairview Ave with uh, a 95th percentile queue of about six to 12 vehicles, so it can stack up up to approximately 12 vehicles on Fairview. And then on Green Street, it's a little less on, uh, on the eastbound left turn, so the, the queuing is, is not as bad as it is on Fairview. Um, based on the simulations that we, that we watched and based on observations, the queuing will, will extend past the driveway, you know, 60 to 80% of the time, but once the, the, the intersection uh, turns green and the phase allows the traffic to dissipate through the intersection, there are adequate caps to get people in and out of the site. And that's, that's happening today, and it will it'll continue to happen in the future just because we're not adding that much traffic to the, the proposed site. In addition, um, just like any other intersection uh, adjacent to a signalized uh, location, um, you will get some courtesy gaps from drivers that allow people to, to make movements in and out, but uh, our analysis shows that you, don't, you would not need those courtesy gaps in order to make that, uh, that with those movements. And uh, just so you, you understand that we're not looking at this in a vacuum, we do uh, simulate these intersections. Um, so we've got, uh, so this is, you know, part of our simulation here, you go, hit the wrong button here. You can see vehicles that will try to make the right turn out, they'll make the right, you know, if, if, once they get the gaps, and then continue through the intersection. We had a vehicle make the right turn out of here. You see vehicles making the right turn in, and this vehicle will try to make a left. And right now we can't make the left because vehicles will start to queue past the site. He needs to wait until this dissipates. So as you can see, this will continue to queue back, queue back, and eventually when this turns green, they'll be able to make the left turn out. So these are the types of analysis we do. They turn green, they queue, it allowed that one vehicle to exit, and then once the, the signal turns red again, it'll start to queue back again. So those are the types of analysis that we do in order to make sure that these driveways operate adequately in the future. Um, this is just an overall site plan, if, uh, if anyone has any questions in terms of access where the driveways are. Uh, but that's uh, pretty much a summary of uh, the traffic study that we've done today. Uh, as Chuck noted, uh, we did get some uh, the, uh, the comments, and I, I, first time I saw them was today, was uh, talking about restricting access at this location here. So we'll have to work with through, uh, through DOT to, to see what sort of restrictions they, they really want to move forward with, and uh, you know, we'll you know, update our study as, as appropriate once we talk to DOT. Would you be willing to make this PowerPoint available to us? Sure. Thank you. Yep. So just for the record, so what I think I understood you to say is that the current intersection is safe, and once you do this, it will remain safe and will be... In terms of delay, the delay is not, it does not create a failing condition. So safety is different than delay. Okay, so could you make a statement about safety? We have not we have not done a detailed safety assessment. Uh, we did request accidents at this location, but we've not uh, broken them down. If that's something the board wants, we can definitely look at the types of accidents that are have been experienced at this intersection in the past and determine it, it, is it a result of the, the operations of the signal? Is it a, a result of the uh, the driveways themselves, we, we've actually had the MV-104s, which are the detailed uh, police reports. We could sift through those and see what types of accidents are being experienced at this intersection in the past and determine whether or not uh, the driveways would contribute to that in the future. So that is something we could provide to the, to the board in the future. Um, do you have uh, modern pedestrian traffic? Yes, that, we, that's a, a difficult intersection. Okay. We did observe pedestrians, and we, we noted how many pedestrians we did see in, in the study. I mean, I, I will qualify that with uh, that we did observe this at the end of November, so it's not peak summertime, right. so we didn't get as many uh, pedestrians as you, know, you may get when it's a little nicer out. Um, but, you know, if Stewart's is willing to uh, install some pedestrian accommodations, that, you know, that would accommodate... Uh, um, pedestrians on, you know, crossing uh, either concurrently with traffic or through an exclusive pedestrian phase, we'd have to do some additional analysis and talk to DOT to see what their preferred method of pedestrian crossing is. Uh, you know, do they, you know, concurrent crossing is when the the, uh, the the signal goes green on one approach and you kind of cross with the signal. An exclusive pedestrian phase would be when the entire signal just shuts down and pedestrians can walk in any on any approach they want. So we'd have to take a look to see how efficient the signal is and, uh, and whether or not uh, 
you know, adding that phase to the signal would increase delay to the point where you would, you know, maybe start to get some failing movements because you, you had you, I guess, steal green time from the, the traffic movements to provide them for the pedestrians. Actually, to follow up that, on that question, do you guys do an assessment of pedestrian activity boosted because of your? No, because we can't. We can't tell when the customer comes in if it's a pedestrian or if they came from a car. So we don't track increased, you know, pedestrian. One of the things that we discussed pretty early on though was, is there a lack of pedestrian activity because the intersection is so bad, or do people just not, you know, just not walk in this area? Um, so. I mean, I think the pedestrian accommodation will incentivize people to walk. I mean, that's the build it and they'll come mentality. Okay, any other questions from the board? Did you want a safety assessment? Well, what do you all think? My sense is this is not a dangerous intersection, and reading the reports that I've seen. I don't have a sense that there's ever been a serious accident in the intersection. And I ask because there's a kind of generally expressed opinion that the intersection feels unsafe. So I think it would be interesting to. Then let's do a safety assessment. Is that okay? Yes. I mean, fair painful. Yeah. All right. I think it would be helpful. I, I think, I mean, then coming through them, you know, somewhat quickly, I think you're going to find a lot of rear end, you know, accidents. I don't think there's anything uh, completely catastrophic. I, think I don't think we're looking for a huge assessment. Yeah, just the, no, no, just the accident. Of right. How many accidents per year, what type of vendors, you know, on breakers, whatever, and your opinion on what this will do to that accident. There might help lay some concerns. If if it's a positive report. Yeah, and one of the things I think you'll find is if you do have um, left turning movements with rear end accidents and you restrict left turning movements, the accidents go away. Yeah, I think it sort of goes <laughs> hand in hand with the DOT yeah. report. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think that would all be useful. So we know the better. So our goal would be to improve safety, improve pedestrian access, and beautify the intersection and avoid excessive over-design of the traffic, I think. Actually, that's a question that I have. What would take this from a C to a C plus or, or a B? What interventions could be possible? The, um, right now, the, the signal operates pretty inefficiently. It's a pre-time signal, meaning that there's no actuation. So if someone pulls up, the signal's not recognizing them. And if, say, there's no traffic on the westbound leg, it's not automatically trying to get over to, to, to serve the eastbound mm -hmm. light, you could put in some sort of actuation to do that where it gets a little more responsive and that would improve operations and, uh, and, and potentially just improving the phasing of it. Uh, right now the, the signal just doesn't have the capability to do that so it just kind of runs on, on a, almost like a clock where every 25 seconds to 35 seconds it just serves support lights. And what um, municipality is responsible for that signal? Is it the city or DOT? I'm unclear who owns the signal and who maintains it and who is responsible responsible for it. The city, the city owns it. Thank you. So, so if that was a recommendation, which it seems as though you're making, then it would be. What's the process for making that? In general, what would be the process for making that kind of a recommendation? It would be something that. Would I'm not saying it's a recommendation because the, the signal will operate similar to the way it is now. So if you're talking about improving an existing condition, whose responsibility is that? So uh, that's not my that's not, not my call to say who's responsible to, to operate that signal. Yeah, and it's also not tied to the steward. I mean, that's no, not, I'm just it's, asking. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think the city at, at their <clears throat> discretion would undertake that. So. But that, that, would, that would entail, you know, putting loops in the, or in, the, in the road or some sort of microwave detection <clears throat> on the poles, so it, it would involve some signal work and potentially replacing you know, signal heads and things like that, so. Thanks for giving us that Well, if that's it for the board, I think we can open it up to public comments and questions. So, public? 
Uh, yeah, I have a question. I, I live right over there. Um, Could you identify yourself? Sorry, my name is Kurt Wayman. I live over on Fairview, almost diagonally across from the George. Um, I'm really surprised to hear people even questioning whether this is a safe intersection or not, because it's not. Just from a pedestrian point of view, I don't drive much because I like to walk over around Hudson, like most people here do. Um, and I just, it's not safe. I, I have to wait to cross the street. There's no pedestrian cross crosswalk. You have to go around to the other side of the intersection just to get across. There's, um, there's no pedestrian crosswalks between the intersection and Greenport. I don't think there are. Um, there are children coming, going from school. There are families. There are people going to work and back. Um, it's just a crazy intersection. There, there's not uh, a walk sign or anything. There's just, and the cars, they don't. I mean, it says 30 miles an hour, but that is not enforced. People do not do 30 miles an hour in that intersection. Um, it's just, it's not safe. Um, I know it's my opinion, but I, I do live right there, and I just, I feel very unsafe crossing that intersection any, any time of day or night. So, I do have a question about the design of the, um, the four-foot-high vinyl fence that was described. That, is, I guess, its purpose is to stop head beams from bothering people who live in the area. Um, I didn't hear any talk about the level of lighting underneath the canopy where the pumps are or on the storefront or anything like that. I assume if this whole thing is doubling in size, there's going to be a significant amount of light that's added to this intersection. Um, and uh, you know, obviously people are trying to sleep at night. And I already have to lower my blades, my, my window shades at night, because of one street light that's across the street from me. And it's not even a store. And what's going to happen? When this whole thing gets, it's going to be like bright as day at night, and no one in the area is going to be able to sleep, and that leads to obviously, uh, it's, it's a health issue, because if you can't sleep, I'm already lacking sleep, I'm already going nuts, what's going to happen to me when I can't sleep even, you know, less than I am now? Um, there's, just, uh, there's a lot that's not being talked about here that I think ought to be talked about, I think people have concerns, and I think that... The whole, I don't know why we're tying up the issue of public safety or pedestrian safety with Stewart's desire to expand their business. The, these two issues shouldn't be tangled up to each, with, it, with each other. You guys shouldn't be depending on Stewart's to make improvements that makes the, the intersection safe for the people who live in Hudson. We should be doing that anyway. That's our obligation, right? I mean, we should be making it safer for, for pedestrians. And, to, completely apart from what Stewart's is doing. Right? That's one discussion. Then there's another discussion which I've already been talking about how stewards uh, is going to be impacting the, the people who live in that area. So that's some concerns of mine. I have a whole notebook full, but um, I'll just sit down now and let someone else talk. Thank you. It, what, I would, what I would prefer to do is I would prefer to let everyone kind of speak and then um, obviously, you know, we submitted a lighting plan. I can go through that um, to address this individual's right. concerns. It that but way. if the if three more people speak to lighting, I'd rather answer all of their questions at once versus okay. individual items. Michael Lasore, 12 Fairview Avenue. Uh, as far as the lighting, I believe number 10 Fairview 12, all the way down to 24 or 26, 28, all those houses are on the same level. I can stand on my front porch and I can look all the way down Fairview <coughs> Avenue, down my block, and see on everybody's front porch what's going on. The lights on the canopy are low enough. They're at eye level with people's living rooms. So 12, 14, 18, 20 Fairview, 22 Fairview, nobody has their front curtains open at night. Everybody has their blinds down because those lights are coming right into the living room. They need to be 30 feet high or the canopy has to be built around the side so that the light's not going across Fairview Island. You know, we speak here about, oh, Green Street's going to get an 8-foot wall. I can't build a fence higher than 6 feet, you know. I, you know, I need a new stockade fence on the back side of my house. 6 feet. Oh, well, now we're going to get an eight-foot concrete wall, and they're going to do something about the lighting to protect people, protect the lights from shining down Green Street. And my big question here is I'm happy Stewart wants to come in and make a nice, new, shiny store. 
God bless it. Okay? It'll look better because the store that's there now looks like crap. And we're discussing the traffic here, and we're discussing the safety. I want to know who gave the permission and said it's okay that we're going to have four fueling stations. Has that been approved? Has that been a given since the get-go when the city and planning and the city council approved all of this? That, oh yeah, you can have a new store and, you know, that's fine. And that was the, the ordinance I believe the city council voted on. Okay, yeah, you guys go ahead, stores, you can buy the two buildings next door and build your store. Did that come with a guarantee, like on the side, like, oh yeah, you get four gas pumps with it too? Because this is the elephant in the room right now. Well, and then if it is, I mean, this instance, I will interject. There's two gas pumps there now that have four fueling positions, and we propose two gas pumps that have four fueling positions. So there's no net increase in the number of fueling positions. And I will comment that the original proposal had three, three fueling positions, and with six is three and six. We did so reduce it. So meeting the current standard, not increasing. So under this canopy, we're going to only have two pumps. Two pumps. And there's not going to be, you know, on your, see on your gas pump, if you're not doing diesel, one side, you got a hose coming out one side of the, the square box. There's a hose coming out, well, three hoses coming out one side of the box. And three hoses coming outside of the other side of the box. Right? You're pulling it in a gas station, huh? Lead? Or, you know, premium, it's, it's big it's rig. One, it's yeah. one hose. Yeah. It's just three choices. It's just, oh. Yeah, so what you have is you have 87. Okay, so one on each side of four pumps is eight fueling stations. Yeah, but it's one on each side of two pumps, so it's four fueling stations. It's on the map. I mean... I definitely know what you're saying, but they actually are not yeah, it's, increasing it's, look, it's, it's, any it's, kind of pumps. One, two, three, four. And now you have two. No. Now we have four. No, you're, you're, There's only two gas pumps over there. You're right. There's you're only right. two gas pumps. And that's you're right. Just yeah. 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 There's going to be two pumps or four pumps? Two pumps. Two. So what happens is, like you're saying, like, if I stand on this side of the table, Ooh, I just closed that. Or if, I stand on, or if I stand on this side of the table, it's still one table. Right? So, like, I'm on this side, now I'm on this side, but it's still one table. Like, it's the same thing for fueling. So, you can go one, two, three, four. There are two pumps and four fueling stations. A total of four cars can be fueling at one time, which is what they have now. It's, it's three buttons that we check. So, but why, so why is it such a larger canopy? Yeah. Oh. That's assuming. Okay, I understand your, your, your table point here, okay? There's your table, and that table has one hose coming out the way it is now. Well, what's to stop anyone from putting a gas pump that has a hose on each side? Now you have gas. See? I can't do it. You see? You see? You see where I'm going with this? No. When I pull into the Hess station, could you put the side plane back up? When I pull into the Hess station, there's a hose on each side. That's we're agreeing. And right with that. now they have at Stewart's only one hose coming right, out. All right, here we go. Here's the site plan. You, here's a pen. You sh you show us what. what and I'm not trying to. I'm being very sincere here. One, two. Three, four. Now it doesn't matter how many hoses there are because if you have a vehicle parked in spot one, another vehicle couldn't obtain the same space because you can't. That's that's a second law of physics. You can't obtain two objects can't obtain the same space at the same time. It doesn't matter how many hoses you have because if you have eighty-seven and ninety-one or ninety yeah ninety-one octane gas and it's mixed at the dispenser for 89 octane, it's not three separate hoses. <coughs> like you, is that what you're getting at? No. Okay. Okay. What you have now, I'll stand up with you still. Everybody. Uh, you can go to the board and draw. I mean, I, I can't figure it out. What we have now at Stewart's 
is one pump with one hose. And it can take care of one car at a time, whether it's on this side or whether it's on this side. No. That's yeah. not, no, that's not correct. That's not correct. No, I'm not trying to like. No one else in the room agrees with you. I, 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 I can't do it. I don't think. <laughs> if we double the number of pumps, but we're not. not. Yeah. So when you're telling me there's there's two, there's four underneath your canopy. There are two pumps, and each pump has a, a left and a right station. Yeah. Like now, just exactly like now. If you go there now. I can get on either side of the island and I can fill from one side or the other. So let's talk about car positions. There are currently, correct me if I'm wrong, four car positions possible. And when this is all done, redone, new stewards, there will still be a total of four car positions because stewards already agreed to reduce by two to the number. They were going for six, now they're back to four. Will it this area that's being covered, uh, the Hess station, will it be as big as Hess? Because eight, Hess has eight fueling stations with four pumps. We're not doing that. That's not in this plan. Um, I'm just trying to understand on the topic of the larger trucks that are going to be pulling in here to gas up. Uh, that's going to be the amount of trucks gassing at this location is probably going to increase whether or not the, tra the traffic is increased or not, um, right? When there be more trucks? They were talking there. about fuel trucks making deliveries. Yeah. Exactly. Not so there's not going to be just how generally fuel some of the trucks pulling. I, yeah, if okay. they don't have okay. diesel, so they can't. Right, right. you know, well, right. a whole moment there. I mean, we don't have high flow diesel. I mean, the, the potential exists that we would. I'm sorry, you don't yeah, have. We don't. We don't have high flow diesel. Yeah. I mean, the potential exists that we would do low flow diesel for. Um, you know your your well, yeah I mean your diesel vehicles diesel mm -hmm. vehicles like but that would occupy the same fueling position so it, it might be an alternative handle yeah. but it won't be an additional fueling position. But would it bring in would it bring in trucks to get to get fuel? no no Just diesel cars and stuff. I mean any other it would be in any other truck that would try to navigate for lunch it wouldn't be like a truck stop. Okay. Um, do you want to address? Uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> the plantings. So far, the landscape company out of Saratoga that takes care of the stewards, landscaping is a failure. It's wood chips. One year they had three marigolds. You get a little tray for a dollar eighty nine. You get six. Hudson got the All right. That's their landscaping. Now, uh, the trees here. I see four trees. Uh, can we specify in this plan that we're getting full-size trees? Like, we don't want any trees that are three feet tall, whatever a landscaper can buy cheap, and they come in, stick them in the ground, and then they turn into Galloway trees, you know, that are just little skinny sticks there that haven't grown in 15 years. You know, can we specify it in, 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 the, in the plant? You know, you don't get your up. Well, yes. They we specified want three real trees. They specified three and a half inch caliper, which is a reasonable size. You know, if you put too big a tree in the ground, half the time it dies because you, you, you constrain the root system. So we can discuss this at length later on. but. The idea, I believe, a three and a half inch tree is large enough so that everybody would agree that they've put a real tree there, but it's small enough so it can develop a set of roots, you know, independent of being constrained in a in a root ball. So um, I don't know, you know, if we wanted bigger trees, we can certainly see about it. My observation is these um, sidewalk maples they've got they've got about a six to eight inch annual growth, so they're going to grow real fast. But, you know, sure, I'm sure Chuck's easy going. He'll give you a four inch caliber. <laughs> Maybe. What do you think? Can, can we get an assurance on the lighting that it's not going to cross Fairview Avenue and enter into everyone's living room? This one's for you. Yeah, I'll come back to lighting as a general topic um, at the end of 
everyone else is. Okay. Can we? We, we have a, a street light problem there. Now. Not my problem. Can we talk? Okay, but that's not the, the city, but we also have a, a lighting problem at Stewart. Okay. Can Can we, we, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, in your simulation, does that account for human error? Because it just seemed like what it would be like in a perfect world. Because I know you said 88 cars now for traffic and adding another 66 after the renovation. Yes. So does that account for human error when driving? Because it really doesn't go like this. Human error in, when the people are driving their cars. Yeah, because, I mean, everybody's not going to be going the same miles per hour, and it's you're the, adding in 66 yes, miles. The, so. the simulation takes into account different driver behaviors. Okay. So if there's... Someone that's nine years old and they drive slower, and there's someone that's 16 and they drive faster. It, it has different variation for driver characteristics. It does take that into account. It's, but it's not going to have a car off track into a, a lane and make an a improper turn. Mm -hmm. But it, it's essentially trying to determine how much average delay. I mean, there's always going to be little variances, but this is not the. I guess the, the thresholds here are not to the point where we're so close to an app where something's failing, where we're at level sort of B's and C's and you know, you know, even if there is a, a margin of error of ten percent, it's not gonna throw this intersection into an app, I guess is my point. Okay. And my next question is the safety assessment, are you guys gonna make that available to the council or to the public? Um, just because there's a lot of constituents who feel like that corner is not safe. Um, I've never had an accident there, but I've had a ton of close calls. Um, so I just want to know if that would be available to the public. Yes, absolutely. And we're hoping somehow in all of this to get a green island, some really good pedestrian crosswalks, and some traffic calming elements that will make them. But that's larger than just stewards. That goes into it. Yeah. But, but shouldn't that be considered before all this happens? Though? Thank you. Well, this just seems backwards to me. Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Why? So you mentioned that there's already thoughts of having a green island and having crosswalks and all these things. But what Stewart mm -hmm. does here is going to impact the ability to do all those things, right? Well, speaking very personally, given what they have now, which is a kind of endless access apron that even at the corner, if I remember correctly, you can just drive in and out there, they've pushed the entrances to the uh, drive area as far out as possible and created what doesn't exist now, which is a green corner. And when I look at that corner and I line it up with the sidewalks across the street, for the first time I imagine we could have a crosswalk that arrives at a sidewalk and not a curb cut. So I think my answer to you is the planning board has already been working with stewards to get this site plan to a point where we could plug in the kind of improvements to the intersection that you're talking about. But Stewart's is not, you know, their property line is their property line. They don't go past that. We're just trying to <coughs> negotiate a solution that allows the city to add enhancements. It just feels like the city is relying too much on what a corporate company wants to do for its own, you know, from, from a business point of view. Um, instead of thinking about the long-term effects of what this kind of change would have on Hudson as a city. I mean, if, if, if Stuart, if, I mean, everyone's, everyone's watching this. Everyone's watching this see what happens here, right? So we all know what happened up the street in Fairview where we have all those strip malls and all those gas, like 12 gas stations up there, not too far away. If this, if Stuart doubles in size, what do we have? Okay, so that brings a lot of what's happening that way into Hudson because if you're going to have a great big parking lot on a corner, which is, Great, terrific. Then you look at other businesses that are between Stewart's and where we are right now. There is, because there are other gas stations. They're not huge, they're small too. They probably have the same wants and needs as Stewart's has. So on Green Street, you have a Speedway. It's got a lot of pumps, but it's got a teeny tiny little store. I'm sure they're watching to see what happens here. I'm sure they would love to tear down the building and double their size. Well, then once they do that, then there's a Sitco across the street from, from the town square park on 700 block. They're, they're about this big. I, I, I mean, so, so what's going to stop them from wanting to do the same thing? It's just going to keep coming. I, I think there's, um, again, I'd rather not interject. I mean, legislatively, the council enacted a, a local law that um, 
dealt with historic non-conforming uses in the city. I mean, that Stewart's has been there since 1973. So for 45 years, it's operated, and then the zoning has essentially changed around it. Now, what happened is, I think some of the properties you're speaking to are not even in the city. I think they're in the, the town of Greenport. Um, and the city enacted one local law that addressed non-conforming uses. Um, at one point, an overlay district was um, forwarded, um, and that was denied. So the adjoining houses can't become commercial unless there's, a, again, a legislative adoption by the city council. So some of those concerns aren't actually founded in what, what can, what, can proceed. What variance did Stewart's get from the zoning law? Uh, I'm, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a, I mean, the, the, the zoning has changed, allowing the, the one-time expansion of a non-conforming use. It's not a zoning variance. So we're, we're, we're established in the, where we have an adopted right to the, the, the property and the site plan through the legislation. Um, it's not, a, not an instance where a variance was obtained. Any other? Um, yes. Oh, yes. I, I just want to comment. My name is Craig Bay. I'm the city code official, but I'm not going to talk on behalf of that. I just want to hit a little bit on your safety concerns. Prior to being a code official, I'm also a member of the City Hudson Fire Department. I have been for 32 years. Out of them 32 years, 15 of them I was a lieutenant and a captain. Eight of them I was a chief officer. And the chief officer position I held from 2006 to 2014. Just to give you a little bit of a, an insight, that intersection, in the intersection, off the top of my head, I can count on one hand how many personal injury traffic accidents we had at that intersection. We had them beyond the intersection, we've had them before the intersection, but not in the intersection. We could probably add a few more numbers of the accidents that actually occurred in the parking lot. So again, in eight years, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, one personal injury involving a car and a, a pedestrian. So that's as it's currently said. And the reason I want to say this is because there is a safety concern, and the fire department has a safety concern, and I'm sure the police department does as well. But it's already been proposed that at best, this intersection is going to be made better. There's safety concerns that DOT is looking at, I'm sure the fire chiefs are looking at, DOT is looking at, and Storks is looking at as well. So again, I'm not trying to say either way what goes on and who does what, but I can say from experience, as a lifelong resident of this city and a fire chief officer, that there's been very minimal safety issues in that intersection. And then, then reports are all forable. You can get them through the fire chief's office, I, I can tell you, for eight years, I probably signed most of them. And out of that, there's probably been maybe a half a dozen. Yeah, a quick follow-up to that. You said that there have been how many personal injury accidents? Well, off the top of my head, if I had to guess, less than a half a dozen. How many accidents? Can't answer that because the fire department don't go to non-personal injury accidents unless they're requested by police. But at a slow-moving intersection, there would probably not be many personal injury accidents. There would probably be a lot more accidents. And, and, and that would be something that the police department would have on record. They have to. But again, just knowledgeable as a fire chief officer, and when we're talking about public safety, there's concerns there over the course of the years. And, and again, I mean, Mr. Sawyer, you live right there. You, exactly. You know, how many people have been run over by cars there? How many fender benders? You see what I'm saying? So that's now. This company and DOT and I'm, I'm assuming Department of Public Works is going to be involved. They're going to make it better. I just wanted to put that out there as a concern. Maybe that will help the train of thought and give you a little bit more rest. Thank you. Thank you. And we are now going to have a safety yeah, the safety assessment is going to be submitted. Which, which, which will include uh, any particular accident? It's all, it's all accident. Yes, it'll be all accident. You, 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 you request it from DOT, and uh, they give you, you know, non-reportable accidents, which are less than $1,000. They give you, you know, cool. personal injury. They give you everything. Well, you can tell there's a public perception that the intersection is not safe. There seems to be some disagreement. 
we, we do believe the intersection will be safer once we've been able to affect some design changes. So, you know, it's just part of the process. Don, did you have a... Yeah, Don Moore, just a point of information. This has come up before about who controls the traffic lights. And I just uh, went back and forth with uh, the superintendent of public works. It's all the city. The DOT is not involved Great. in any uh, jurisdictional issues with the traffic signals in the city or there. So, so just, just that, just again, reference. That's just the signals, though. So the the access would be still right. a DOC But if we wanted to improve, or if you wanted to, right, the, 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 city, the city, yeah. that's entirely a city. Eight years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, a truck took out the telephone pole that supported the traffic light on that corner in front of my house. That pole had been there since I bought the house, when my family bought the house in 1958. Truck finally took it out. Boom. So they put a temporary pole in my front lawn six or seven years ago. It's still there. Rob Perry told me that it was only temporary, <laughs> that he had gotten a metal pole from the county that he had down on uh, down by the sewer plant that he had, and they were going to stick that pole because they can't stick that pole in my front lawn. Uh, there's, now there's a cable that's supporting the, the leaning pole that's holding up the traffic light that's temporary. Rob Perry told me, he says, the city can come in and put that pole in your front lawn. You can't do nothing about it. But you can't, we can't put that cable in your front lawn. It's too far down. So I told him, you do not have permission to put that cable in my front lawn. It's still there. It's been six or seven, eight years. Pat McKenna, who owns number 10, I, he, at that time, he was working upstairs in this building in parking. And I think maybe he, he told Rob that, hey, he didn't want that big metal pole in his front yard because that front pole, that pole was going to be there and it's going to have a big arm out over into the intersection to hang the traffic light. So right now, what you have up there is this temporary situation. I don't know what's up for Mr. Perry. Yeah. You know, and his, and his wire that's in my front lawn, that's an eyesore, that I have to mow around, been there six, eight years. This is the situation going on with a couple, couple of problems at Fairview. Also, the other major safety problem, and you got a big one up there now, right in front of my house, is that corner that gets run over by cars and trucks all day long. There's a giant hole there in the front now. Cars fall into it and shake my house. That's a problem. What, you know, we'll get back to the storage. We're, we're having a mission for you. Yeah. 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 I want to ask one, one question on your behalf, because I feel your frustration. Intersections on your plate. I thought it might be worth mentioning. 
given the proximity to the hospital of that intersection, presumably there is some ambulance traffic through there. I don't have any data or any, any numbers. But I'm wondering if it makes sense for the board to get a little input in from, from the local ambulance companies as to what challenges they might have experienced navigating that intersection, especially under emergency conditions. Okay. Maybe they have already. But I, I think what this begs for is for the planning board to make the intersection an object of study and to work with the appropriate members of the city government to see what measures we can make to improve it. But tonight, we're here to talk about the Stewart's proposal in and of itself. So I apologize, but we have such a big agenda tonight. I think we're going to have to speed this along. So if no one out there has any other, OK, Matthew, yes, please. Hi, I'm Matthew Frederick. I'm an architect. Um, some of you might have seen my blog post. I know a few of you did, and uh, Chuck Wirt, uh, uh, contact me, I appreciate that. Um, there's uh, a number of uh, things that are on here, and if any of you want to copy this, you can see it, or you can just go to my blog, uh, some recommendations to improve the site. But a point I wanted to make, and I, I referenced uh, Walter's axiom, not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I'm not sure, you know, good is hard to define, to define, and I think some folks are trying to throw quantitative things at you when the, when the issue here is really qualitative. So how many pumps, how many injuries, you know, people are trying to find something really tangible. But I mean, this is going to be better in some ways, this intersection, I think it's going to be worse in a lot of ways. It's going to be more open, there's going to be more paving, there's going to be more scattered light, and so on. Um, what I'm asking, among other things, but in my, my blog post I was asking that you balance the bad things in some ways by, in particular, turning this into a street-facing building that accepts walk-up traffic and makes the sidewalk a friendly place. Um, as soon as you face an entrance to the, the parking lot, you're announcing that this is a piece of suburbia stuck into the city. And uh, you know, what I suggested was a corner entrance that would face the street. It looks much more like an urban building. I also suggested a walk-up ice cream window. Uh, I don't want to uh, push that issue too much, but I understand that uh, Stewart's is planning to build, if I'm not mistaken, something like build or rebuild something like 50 stores. And well, it, not true? No. Not true. Well, you are expanding, yeah? Aren't you expanding? All of the stewards? I'm over here. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, Shall I repeat it? Or what? And it's not fit. What is it? Well, what is that? It's uh, probably in the range of 20. Okay. Well, but I don't know where I got 50. I'll blame somebody else. Uh, I'll, I'll blame another blogger. But um, this is a chance to, I think, practice making a more appropriate, a communally appropriate building and to make a few small gestures. Um, there are a number of things to tie together here that I don't think we can negotiate looking at engineering plans. And by the way, this is a problem that we do have with review procedures, is that the community sees engineering plans and it feels like all the decisions have been made and now we have to talk you out of it. And there we go, throwing obstructions at you. So I'm trying to just ask that we, we back up a little bit and just try to deal with it on a, a bit more of a schematic level, make sure that everybody understands how we got where we are, and that we can make a friendlier urban building. I don't think you guys have to give up what's important to you, but I do think you should give us a few things. Just yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. One, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. One point of clarification, uh, Matt, I'm not sure this was clear. My understanding is that the entrance on the street is a real entrance, that it's not, as in the Troy store, a, you know, canopy that has a window, it's actually a, a door. I don't know if that changes your perception or not. It, it, it doesn't. And I, and I'll tell, if you don't mind, I'll tell you, can I, can I address that? No, I briefly? didn't look at your blog, but I didn't print it out. Could we, could we on the board have a couple of questions? Uh, you share that? If there's any extra stuff that I so there have been studies done as far as store security, for example, with one door versus two. And there's a sweet spot where one door works. If you add a second door, you have much more uh, theft until the store reaches a certain footprint size, which is way bigger than 3,700 feet. Because when the store gets big enough, you then have more employees and you can watch two doors. So, uh, so what I'm suggesting is a building that in a lot of ways is better for not just the street, but for stewards. There would be more merchandising space inside with one door uh, instead of two. Um, again, it's a friendlier building. I think it's a more interesting building. Um, 
it, it's not even going to cost a hundredth of a cent on each gallon of milk. Um, and, and by the, the way, it, in my defense, though, with the exception of the corner door, it is almost exactly the same building. I mean, if you look at your points one through six, you know, one was a new landscaped and traffic island, which I've agreed um, we'll go to DOT with. Two was a revised radius transition to accommodate greenery, which um, we show on the corner, or show on the, the screen. The three was the pedestrian accommodation, which I've more than once agreed that we will, we will make. Um, four was the geometry tweaks, which I, you know, didn't necessarily completely understand. And via our email exchange today, say, yeah. you you said that you understood that there it's not completely perpendicular. Um, five was the two-story flat roof, which we have given, and then six was the landscaping of um, our side, which was four mature trees, which we have shown, and the landscaping in almost the exact situation. So, You've proposed it. So if, if the only thing that we're not necessarily agreeing with is the um, corner door. Um, and I think that the corner door from an internal operations perspective has more flaws than the, the two doors. Um, you got to stop building them then because you, you have them. We did stop building them. That's why I'm proposing two doors. <laughs> um, I, I, if I could talk to you about it off you know, outside of the room, I'd appreciate it. But if this building, if you see it as not much different from what you're proposing, then why not do it? Um, this, this, this is, you know, I come at this from an urban design perspective, so not from a, you know, not from a steward's perspective. So I'm trying to speak to the community. I don't mean everybody agrees with me here, but I am thinking about the folks that live across the street that walk up to this uh, facility, not the ones that drive to it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for doing this, Matt, too. This is really terrific. It's so helpful when somebody does something constructive. And, 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 I, did, I, and I did say in my email, I said the same thing. I mean, I might not agree with all of those points, but obviously it was someone who did take, instead of just saying no, they said no, but if here are some recommendations you should consider. I think some of which we've met and some of which we might just have to agree to disagree. Yes. So I'm changing my motto to the better is the enemy of the bad. <laughs> Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's a notion of making the space more community friendly and more, and again, I think we've already beat this quite a bit, which is you're in a residential neighborhood. Clearly, it's if you're a business that, that is larger in suburban areas and more um, uh, uh, exurban areas. This is a very urban area that. You know, it's funny people like, say that, but we have six stores in Albany, we have six stores in Troy, I mean, you know, we have. If I can finish, yeah, I don't know what I'm um, saying. Uh, my point is that I appreciate the gesture towards making it more of a place that people in the neighborhood feel like it's a neighbor, neighborhood location where you can walk up and enjoy some ice cream and have it as a, oh, less of a suburban style um, uh, gas station, more of a neighborhood a location. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did um, when, you know, it became the recommendation of the planning board from the board to the city council is I read the sprawl repair manual. Um, and when you read the sprawl repair manual, they speak to the convenience store as a, a nodal component of a, of a community or neighborhood. I mean, I mean, Stewart's, unlike some of the competitors that are referenced, Stewart's come from a milk, egg, bread, you know, that was the the basis of the business. I mean, this is actually the first stewards that ever had gas. That ever had gas. This one? Yeah. Really? Well, it was an Esso station in 1973. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know the name. Don't get me started. Go ahead. Would you tell us your name? Cynthia Lambert. I live on Green Street. Uh, I'm Chagrin that we're even having this conversation and that this whole thing has even gotten this far. Because I don't know what Hudson really has to gain by having a bigger and better Stewart's. I have nothing against Stewart's. I love their ice cream. But rezoning sets a bad precedent. Tearing down houses sets a very bad precedent. It's a residential neighborhood. There, it used to be completely residential with no commercial, and little by little, we eroded that until it's becoming almost a commercial street. And I don't think that's a very good idea. You're, every day I read about houses being torn down, and houses being condemned, and houses falling down. 
we're losing Hudson. We're losing what people love about Hudson, and that's the residential quality, the, our housing stock, the charm of the city, and making a bigger and better Stewart's and a bigger and better McDonald's on Fairview is not the way to go. Yeah, I had a question, and I apologize if you've already gone over this, but I was I was here for some of the early meetings, and then I missed some, and I expressed some similar um, some similar concerns to Cynthia, and I thought that there was a notion at one point as maybe part of the host benefit agreement um, of possibly creating a fund that included something for affordable housing or something along those lines. And I wonder if that was still on the table, if that was still a part of this. So the overall fund um, would be negotiated um, by the by stewards and the common council. So whatever the, um, the, I mean, I think it's an immediate launching point is the pedestrian accommodation because we don't see that as something we can do without the post community benefit. Um, anything after that would be um, for the discretion of the council, but there has to be some type of nexus to, you know, what we're mitigating. So is it is it housing and you know the, the, the removal of those two houses, or is it non-conforming uses and the need for an updated zoning? I mean, those are those are the, the that's the legislative um, discretion of the council. But hasn't the council already approved this? No. <clears throat> No, the council is not. The, the council has approved the zoning, which enables stewards to pursue the site plan. Um, upon the site plan approval, stewards will have to enter into a host community benefit with the council. So after this, and DOT's approval, which will somewhat happen simultaneously, um, we will then go back to the council and negotiate the host community benefit. And that's where things like Mark's estimate on how much the pedestrian improvement would be, the design fee, um, and then whatever other um, elements are added would be negotiable. But that could still be on the table to, to, to create a fund to create as much affordable housing as is possibly being taken away? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's kind of just a dollar amount. I and mean, what the council decides to direct the funds toward is, is something of their choosing. And they're the discretionary board. God, thank you. This board can't do that. Just no, no, I understand. Just, well, I just, some, people, some people don't understand that, that this board actually can't enter into the host community benefit. It has to be through the council. No, I didn't understand that. So that was thanks for yeah, explaining. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, my name is Susan O'Brien. I live at 24 American. Um, I've already been to the Department of Public Works and we've heard me from the police. The police referred me back to the Department of Public Works when I spoke to Rob Perry about this. Right now on Fairview, people coming south on Route 9. When you get to the intersection, there's a lane that turns right and goes down Green Street. There's a lane that goes straight up Fairview or has the option of going east on Green Street. And then there's a northbound lane that comes north. So people coming south start queuing up for those two either Green Street or upper Fairview lanes. And the parking starts about mid-block on Fairview. And you've got the two little white, like whatever you call them, starting to like squeeze people into there. It's people parking on the street are constantly having their cars side swipe. I think most of them don't get reported because it's a hit and run. You're not even going to report it to your insurance company or whatever. Or it's just or it's just a mirror or it's just a scratch or whatever. Um, are you addressing some kind of? Uh, I actually wanted a line painted down the middle of the road so people would stop like queuing up for those two Green Street and uh, Lower Green Street and Fairview lines. So are you going to change the lines there to address the other, or are you going to take the parking away? Again, the, which is another big the, issue. The irony is that our, as the planning board, our power over this stops at their property line. We've been asked to look at how this property is going No, this is going to be an issue with traffic on the road, which right. I'm assuming they're going to generate more traffic, which is going to be, um, we're either going to take away the parking on the street, which I can see you thinking about that probably already, which will be a real hardship to people on the street that don't have off-site, off-street parking, or um, cars will be continued to be hit. I think this would be part of a larger traffic study that could, the planning board could play a role in that, but it really has to be involving the city's public works department, as you said, DOT, anybody else who has sway over this, if it's a county truck route, um, they're going to have something to say. But we can certainly note that, you know, 
the, I guess my question would be, what is being proposed here that's going to make that worse? Is that what you're saying, that this yes. proposal? Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming, I'm assuming they're assuming they're going to get more traffic. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I mean, all we can do is look at it. What exactly does Hudson have to gain by this? <laughs> Why are we I, doing it? Why? That's, that's not for me to answer. We're the planning board. We've been asked to review a site plan, to make suggestions on how to improve it, and to make sure that they meet the, the law. Every property owner in Hudson has the same rights, Stewart's as a property owner. If you get mad at us for listening to them, then when you want to move your fence too close to your neighbor, you want us to be nice about it. So we're just here to serve the community. And in, in my estimation, we're trying to do the best stewards we can. We want people to come from all over the United States to see what an amazing <laughs> steward is. <laughs> but this is really a question for the town. We're out on the street, so more people get inside swept than parked on the street. Good point. All right. Get back to the lighting. Yeah, the lighting. That's really. Is there, is, is, it, is, it, is it everyone done? I just want to say something. Yes, but please, I was going to construct a comment that we can act on. Uh, what happens here? I can definitely do that. I can definitely do that. Um, so obviously, I've, I've lived in a lot of different places in the country. Hudson is so com community based in a way that I've never seen before. Um, it's really hard for the residents in this area to react to this because they don't understand it. The reason why they don't understand it is because we're looking at plot plans and site and drainage and like we're not we're not seeing this. Right? We need to see more of this so we know how to react to it. We need the tools to understand what's being proposed. We don't have those tools right now. And it would be, that and that? That's my first time seeing that. I haven't seen that anywhere else. I know we can download the PowerPoint somehow, but there needs to be a, a much easier way for the general public to understand what's going on here. And right now, I don't feel like we have that. Thank you. But you have, if you if I just take you back to the yep. lighting issues yep. that, that a couple of you have, but this is actually something we can do something about. So, could, you want to address that again, or? I'm just concerned that with a larger Stewart's in a larger parking lot and a larger canopy. It's going to be so much brighter at night. And anyone who lives within a cast throw of that place is just not going to be able to have peace of mind at night because of the brightness. So that's, that's a genuine concern. It, so one of the concerns about lighting is um, light, you know, brightness and then light escape. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at a, in a dark field, if you look at a lit anything, you're going to say it's bright. In comparison to the, 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 the light around it, it's a It's talking. It'll help. But what, what we did the first time is we had come in with um, 60 LED um, bulbs. And what we've, re we've done is we reduced to the 40 LED um, bulbs. All fixtures are flush mounted fixtures. So at the soffit and at the canopy, they're all. Um, there's no dangling globe, which I believe there is today, um, which might be part of the problem um, for Mr. Sawyer and his neighbors with the light escaping onto um, <coughs> properties across Fairview. But what the LED lighting allows us to do um, is, we, for the most part, there are certain instances, um, we have zero light escape or, or decimals of light escape at the property line. Um, so if you look across at it, will it seem bright? Um, it will be lit, but the light will escape past um, the, the areas that are shown on the plan. Primary source light will yeah. escape. We get reflected light. Correct. Will, will it be less than it is now? Yeah. How does it compare with it? Because that's I, I I can't we don't we don't model what's there today because we're replacing it but I, I mean, I'm fairly certain that it's all globe fixtures uh, judging from the age of the store um, so yes it would be less than than today and if you also think about the fact that the canopy is moving off the corner farther away farther away from the light and then we're 
only installing one pole light. It's not, you know, there aren't individual, the only pole light on the property is right here. So it's not like we're putting yard lights surrounding the, the property. Our main focus is that the building will essentially illuminate the building between the building and the canopy. This driveway will be illuminated, and then because that doesn't exist over here, the, the yard light is going to illuminate that driveway. I, I, it's, it's very technical and scientific. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, it's, it's difficult to understand, but there's supposed to be candles. I mean, I have the same drawing here, and, and thank you. Um, I just... So give me an example of, of something I can go look at tonight that will show me what the light level is going to be. This light is probably 40. 40 foot candles. That's okay. You're, don't worry about it. You're good. I, th this light right now is, is 40 foot candle, they're about, right? So the maximum we're showing is 19.9, so approximately half this light. So this is probably a really 10 foot light. Um, and the, 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 the canopy height is, I believe it's 14 feet. Now one of the issues you have with the, the canopy um, is that we use concrete underneath uh, the canopy, so you have a white surface. Um, we don't have elevations on the canopy, but I believe the canopy is either 14 or 16 feet. Um, but you have a white surface underneath the canopy, so the light essentially gets trapped, kind of like this, where it just refracts back and forth, versus where it hits asphalt and it dissipates because it's black. But cutting off the light source so you don't get the spread of the direct illumination is huge. And then we talked a little bit about color temperature, which is another issue if you have a very white light, so it feels very cold institutional and strikes the eye as very bright. So if you put the color temperature down in the kind of yellow range, it just makes it feel more like a nice light at night. Yeah, and it, again, we decrease. The light will be out, but we'll be out of color. Yeah, I don't think we decreased to the three. I don't think we decreased the Kelvin. So there's another thing that no one's brought tonight, which kind of surprises me. Um, and I, I'm sorry you can't answer this. I'll just say right now you can't answer it. Um, is there anything that can be done? Any studies or any experts we can talk to who would help us know or determine or have a theory about what impact this would have on our property values? Because I can't imagine it'd be very good. A better looking steward wouldn't be better than. With this twice the size with brighter lights? I don't there know. There is data. There is data? Okay. Right. I, I mean, I, I, I can't, and I, I do disagree. I mean, I, I fundamentally disagree with the fact that uh, the stewards that. I mean, if you consider the value of the real estate that has transacted surrounding the current stewards and how essentially awful and dysfunctional that is in comparison to a reinvested nice stewards. So I'm I mean, sorry. All the, but all the all the real estate transactions occur with the stewards in place now. No, so, I, I bought my house in December. My realtor told me not to buy it because of what's happening here. I bought it anyway because I thought I just thought you know Hudson's going to do the right thing, so I bought it. She told me not to. I <laughs> agree. The house across the street on the other corner past corner to your house is now in foreclosure because they couldn't sell it. Uh, the house, the pink house a couple doors down, lingered on the market for two or three years because they couldn't sell it. Because people know what's going to happen and nobody wants to deal with the fallout of the construction and the snarl traffic and the extra lights and the, and the bigger retail establishment in what should be a residential area. 
So yes, it does have an effect on real estate values, very much so. Because I follow the real estate market daily. Every day I look what's sold, how much it's sold for, how long it's been on the market, and I live in the neighborhood. So yes, it does have a big effect on real estate values. There have been formal studies on this, um, which is not say that they're perfect, but yes, there is an impact. It typically extends up to about, I think it was a quarter mile or 1,200 feet or something, and then after that there's no impact. But you know, anecdotally, or just looking at it how I see it, the properties immediately adjacent to the stewards are not in good shape. Why? Well, because if you live next to a gas station, you kind of feel like, why would I, why would I improve this property? So you ride it out, get the rent from it as long as you can without making improvements, and then eventually the gas station says, well, I'll buy it. Um, maybe you tell the story, but what is the estimated construction time you break ground from the time the door opens? Um, somewhere between 12 and 14 weeks. Weeks? Weeks.
And, and can they use the, the light that makes the least light pollution? I mean, you know, yeah, that's what they were. Okay. That's exactly yeah. what they were just talking about. So they, they're, they're, in essence, asking us to decrease the Kelvin. So, so, so if the store closes at 11, which I think most stewards do, then the light on the outside is going to go dark at 11, and then there would be like interior lights on until approximately 11 30. Okay. And the canopy lights go on as well. Yeah. yeah. So the, everything the off at, at 11? Oh, oh, well, inside 11.30, the school. Yeah, okay. I um, would like to make, I'd like to have a motion to adjourn, but to keep the public hearing open okay. so that when we meet next time, we will continue. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so.